singing some of these Christmas songs, we remind ourselves, too, that the songs that we sing um, all point to Christ. They don't point to uh, a season. They don't point to a man coming down a skinny chimney uh, in a red suit. Uh, they point to our, our Savior who came and is coming again. And so with that, we, our hearts are drawn uh, to Christ during the Christmas season. And that we are uh, people throughout the year that point ourselves to cross to the cross and point ourselves to Christ. And so that first announcement, that first Noel that was told to those angels uh, many, many uh, centuries ago, uh, permeates uh, our thoughts throughout the year as we think of the coming of Christ and the announcement of His coming to His church. Uh, we have a few announcements and things to go over um, real quick. So this Saturday is uh, the Church Christmas Party, and that is held at the place in your home. If you need directions, please let me know if um, the special Christmas Party edition of the newsletter will be coming out with um, more the instructions you're about to hear, as well as directions. Uh, but that is this Saturday, all right, at 5.30. Now, um, we're, asking, uh, we're asking people, if you would, sorry to tear my phone. Um, so, as we're coming together for a meal, what we want to do is everybody brings like two family sized um, uh, dishes. So, if your last name begins with anything from A to Z, okay, I'm just saying how many of you are following along. All right, uh, A to Z, um, just bring a, bring a main dish. And then the second thing, if you're, if you're A to K, you'll bring a dessert, and the L to Z brings a side dish or apple. Okay, so everybody's bringing, we'd ask to bring a main dish, and then if you're A to K, to bring a dessert and L to Z, a side dish or appetizer. And then the church will supply um, hot beverages, paper goods, um, all of those kind of things. Uh, uh, please bring a sweater or a jacket because it's going to be um, outside and inside, so we'll have uh, one, uh, uh, one as of right now, unless you want to bring one over, uh, a heater. Place, but we have the back porch and patio that we're going to be using and, and uh, being able to have sitting areas out there as well as inside. And so uh, you probably want to make sure to bring a sweater or a jacket uh, to that. And that is this coming Saturday evening at 530. Um, then that next day, the kids will be uh, encouraging us with a, a special number, a Christmas uh, special. And so uh, plan on being here for that as well. Uh, then that following week, that following Friday night, Christmas Eve, we are having a service with Mango Bible Church in Scottsdale. All right, so that will be um, Christmas Eve, and we'll be joining them, and we've done this before. Um, uh, Pastor uh, Dick Fellers, Dr. Fellers, was um, part of uh, his uh, um, pastoral assistance uh, through this church as he was starting the church up in Tortoise Lakes, and so we want to... Uh, Renew that kindred spirit around Christ with Manual Bible Church. So plan on being there for that if you can. And then uh, one last thing right here. Um, the book director, Charlie, the book director. Charlie, you good? Oh, wow. Okay. I was about to announce it. He is just so eager. That is awesome. Thank you. So um, uh, every... Every family unit should be, have been able of, to have gotten one of these. If you did not get one, please let me know. But this is a gift to you from the church, and it's uh, geared towards the start of the new year, right? So it's 365 uh, daily devotions from Alistair Bag. And if you haven't heard him on uh, radio, he has some encouraging words and, and truth for life, as the title of the book I believe is called. And really want to encourage you, if you look and thumb through that book, not during the sermon, but during this time, that's fine. Um, the, you'll see there's just one page, right? So it's just one page, and it's a good way to, uh, to try to immerse yourself in some thoughts. Uh, it comes with a scripture passage up at the top that you would open that up, and then you would also end with a, a passage at the very bottom of the page. And so uh, with that, I would, I would encourage you to make use of this. Um, and I know uh, many of you already have a reading plan, so you might even have a different avenue to be able to use this. But... But we want to encourage as the new year comes that you would invest yourself uh, in, you would invest in your spiritual life uh, coming into the new year. So 
Uh, with that, um, also our Bible reading for um, the rest of this month is still around the Messianic Psalm. So here, after we sing some songs, we're going to have scripture reading. Our first passage will be um, based upon where we're at right here, Psalm 118. We'll have two weeks of Psalm 118, and then we will end uh, uh, the following two weeks in Psalm 110, really, that um, uh, a very um, famous passage uh, about Christ from Psalm 110. So anyway, um, just recognize that, and if you do want a copy of this chart, I think I've said that before, just let me know. We'll make sure that you have a copy of that if you wanted to check those cross-references between now and Christmas. Um, so anyway, a lot of announcements, a lot of things happening here in the next couple weeks. Um, uh, people are going to be gone, coming and going, and it's important that we, together, though, that we celebrate uh, Christ in a, in a season where our our eyes can be turned to what we have to end the year. My work is really busy, um, which that might be your job situation right now. Um, in all the busyness of this life, uh, the the opportunity that we have during the Christmas season is to really focus our attention on on Christ. When the rest of the world tries to draw it away from it, um, we want to draw our attention to Him. And so uh, let's do that as a church as we meet together and celebrate. Christmas party as we celebrate music and, and even the, the weekend of Christmas, we'll have some special music for a clarinet ensemble and, and all of these things that we would point ourselves to Christ. So I'm going to open us up in prayer. We're going to sing some more of these uh, Christ songs and then open the scriptures uh, and then uh, we will end our service here in a little bit. Uh, children, um, just a reminder for parents, but um, as the children next week is their um, time to be able to go through and give us a, a special number, we will be dismissing them so that they can review their songs and their verses and stuff with Abby and Molly and, and lead them in that. Uh, so we will break after the scripture reading and in the song, and we'll have an opportunity to go back and start working on those things. So let's pray, and then we'll stand, and we're going to uh, continue singing. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for drawing us to yourself. And you did that um, through the person of Christ uh, in him coming in flesh and him coming uh, to us. Uh, and even through that first announcement, that first Noel that took place uh, outside Bethlehem um, uh, several, two millennia ago. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that that message that Christ has come and is coming again uh, continues. And so uh, help us, our spirits to be encouraged uh, that our God indeed became flesh for us and announced himself unto the world that he would be the savior of all those who put their faith and trust in him. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand. <laughs> Christmas Day. 
Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 118. The scriptures will be read so that what we believe and confess is what the scriptures confess. We'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed far so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. And then turn to Galatians 2. And we'll read verses 1 through 10. Galatians 2, verses 1 through 10. Then after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, worked also through me or mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word that you've given to us. It is powerful, more power, powerful than any arguments or persuasion that we can come up with. And as we sit under the preaching of your word tonight, please convict us of sin, help us to repent, and then go live out the gospel this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand and sing.
those who are participating in the children's program or would like to learn scripture tonight and sing some songs together can head to the back. For those who remain, we will continue our study through John. So if you can turn to John chapter 20. These are exciting moments because for those of you who've been around Crosspoint for a while, we have been in John literally for years. And we are coming to the end of John, which is uh, exciting, I think, to, to study a book together all the way through and to see the themes that have been running its course. But also, uh, hopefully you love God's Word more. And hopefully you love the Lord more as you see um, the perfect wisdom of our God, the power of our God, uh, and just uh, realize no no man could have constructed this. No human uh, would be ingenious enough to not only write this narrative, but for all this to happen and occur. And as we're looking tonight in John 20, and at the same time, having our eyes uh, gaze toward Bethlehem, where uh, well, John doesn't go into the narrative of the birth of Christ. There certainly are references to it that hopefully, to, as a comparison of these two events, the advent and the resurrection, the Lord might strengthen your faith and accomplish what John sets out to do in John 20 and 31, that these are written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing have life with you. Let's ask God's help today. These moments, Father, are humbling as we believe the Word is inspired, that your Word is life-giving, that your Word proceeds from you to us, and we are under your Word. And our prayer is that your Word might be used by your Spirit both to open our eyes to truth, that you might engage our heart, not just our intellect, that our wills would be submissive to you, O Lord, that we might delight in the God of history, the Lord who created it all, the Lord who designed it all, the Lord who left heaven to come to earth in our place, in our stead, and he stood on the cross, and he suffered, we were buried, rose again. We rejoice in these truths that sound archaic to the modern ear, just as they did to the ear of those in the days of Christ. The Lord might we together discover and rejoice and believe the gospel and so love you and cherish you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and read uh, John 20 as we finish John um, uh, we'll pick it up actually in verse 38. We reference the, dis the disciples of Christ who ministered on the behalf. We'll read about Joseph and Nicodemus and then go into the resurrection. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And in the place where he had, was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close to hand, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it stood dark, and saw the tomb had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, 
not lined with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet he did not understand the scripture, he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their home. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples that I had seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said, told him, We have seen the Lord. He said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. And put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen these? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. So... We have uh, entered this final moment of John, and the death of Christ has happened, the burials happened, and then today, uh, the resurrection. And as we think about this section, we realize a couple of things. One is the, the disciples lived with uh, broken hearts. Uh, they were fearful and scared. And two Thoughts we read that they were locked in a room, secure <clears throat> for fear. And so as we read it now, we might wonder, well, why were they so afraid? Why were they bothered? Why were they not just believing like I believe? And we notice that they had yet to understand the scripture, right? They didn't understand it yet. And, and we might even remind ourselves that even those of us who do understand the scripture, or believe we do, may struggle at times believing. Might, if we're candid, we might say there are moments when, when, yes, my faith is tested. I'm challenged in some way. And so as we look at the disciples' situation, and we ourselves anticipate the return of Christ, the second advent, we wait for Jesus as well. And this text, I think, may help us as we think of the context, both of the first advent, that those are waiting for the birth of Christ, and as we look at ourselves at his return. When we think of the Christmas season, uh, Kevin Bowder writes, uh, Advent anticipated the entrance of the Savior into the world and focused upon the reason for which God needed to send the Savior, namely human sin. It was an occasion for pondering the darkness of the world into which God sent the true light. 
Consequently, Advent was a season for affliction of the soul rather than festivity, a time to consider one's own contribution to the weight of guilt that the Savior would have to bear. The sensibility of Advent is nicely captured in the most famous of Advent hymns, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns and lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. And often, as our world processes this time of year, it's, it's simply celebratory, or it's simply sentimental, or it's simply um, uh, a commercial exercise, or maybe a time to love each other, maybe in its, its, its best form. But is in church history, this Advent season had a more significant focus, and that focus was, was seeing the, the darkness of the world and appreciating God who sent the true light. Think of Israel's situation after hundreds of years of waiting for the birth of the promised Messiah, the Messiah who would free Israel from oppression, then the disciples see the death of Jesus Christ. And what did this do? This seemed to dash the hope, right? We've been waiting, waiting, waiting. We think the Messiah's here. He's going to free us. And then he dies. The unjust persecution that we read last week, the, the crucifixion, the trial, the, the fraudulent trial that seemed to appear to end this plan of God and the disciples, that, that's where they were at. As we notice the, the comment of John that they didn't believe until they saw the empty tomb and the clothes arranged there. They, they had yet to believe, they didn't understand it yet. So as we look at their situation between Friday and Sunday, we see affliction, pondering, hopelessness. So, as we approach this text tonight, my prayer would be that John 20, 31 would happen for us today, because we too wait for Jesus. He has come, and he has promised to return. As we look at God's faithfulness, and I think an important, I don't know, an important activity that you and I can engage in regularly is to recall the faithfulness of the Lord. Um, if, if you don't, uh, don't just do it so that it might um, so that it might foster good deeds in your life, but, but do it so that it might call you to future faith. So as we think on the, the goodness and the promise-keeping God, and, and we'll do this tonight, we see we did this last week as we looked at the Messianic uh, promises and psalms about the suffering Messiah, that, that God might use it in your own heart to not only help you believe the resurrection happened, but to help us believe in the future. That what God has said is going to occur will happen. And demonstrations of God's faithfulness in the past will fuel, fuel future faith in God's faithfulness and grace in the future. Do you feel like you're it, maybe in your workplace or of your relationships that you that very few believe as you do about the Bible, about God, about Jesus Christ? Um, and and you know if you look at the text of Scripture, both in the Advent and in the Resurrection, um, few believe either event would happen. We notice in Verse 1 and 2 of, of 20, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Uh, some of the other Gospels inform us that there were other women that came. What was Mary's response to the empty tomb? Verse number 2 tells us her, her, her critical thinking resulted in they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know that later. So she thought Somebody had taken him and removed him. Her, her first thought wasn't he's resurrected, it's that he's been stolen. We commented in verse 9 and 10 that the, the other disciples similarly did not believe yet in the resurrection. They don't understand it. Think about the birth of Christ. 
How many were anxiously anticipating the birth of Jesus? Was there any? Well, there were a few. Uh, Simeon and Anna in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 32, were, were living that way. The elders of Israel knew the promises in Matthew chapter 2 when they heard the announcement of uh, the king was born, where would he be born at? They were able to tell Herod, but it didn't spark curiosity in them. It didn't, they were like, oh, let's go check this out. Let's find out. Is this, this is Messiah? They quickly disregarded it. And how did Herod see the birth of Jesus Christ? He saw this threatening. In fact, his, his result was, let's kill the child. In fact, if I can't kill him, let's kill all the kids, right? So we make sure we kill this threat to, to, the, to my rule, my authority. So few believe either event would occur. I, I think that's interesting to contemplate the resurrection. Like Our faith rests in the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, we have no faith. But the disciples of Christ at this point were not of the opinion that there was going to be a resurrection, even though Jesus had... We look at it now, say plainly had told it, it didn't connect. So few believe either event would occur. Secondly, we notice both events were revealed to unlikely witnesses. John takes us to Mary Magdalene. Turn with me over to Luke 24.2. Excuse me, I apologize. Luke 24, 10. I believe it's down. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. So those who had gone with Mary on the to the two initially were this group of women. John focuses on Mary. Again, we talked about the gospel writers and how each of them were writing from a diff different perspective. So John is not indicating only Mary was there, but his focus was on Mary and Mary's story. But we read from the other gospels that there were a number of women that came. But Mary, Mary very specifically is the one that Jesus reveals himself to. Look down in verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw the two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to him, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and know where they've taken him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, come to where you laid him, and I will take him away. He said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascended to my Father, and your Father, to my God, and your God. Then Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples that had seen the Lord. It's interesting, the first person with Peter and John uh, see the empty tomb, it doesn't appear that they saw the Lord as Mary did. They saw the empty tomb and believed, but, but Jesus revealed himself to Mary. And this is interesting, I've read this in numerous places, that in that time, in that time period, in that culture, sighting a, a woman was countercultural. This would not have been the way that that culture operated. But we, as we studied John in, in our study of Luke a few years ago, we noticed that Jesus' ministry was very different than, than the way the world operated. Uh, Jesus uh, ministered and, reached and preached the gospel, and his ministry team was comprised of people that were rejected by many in society and culture. And his, his first eyewitness testimony was a woman, and to the reader of this day, I, I want you to see the significance of this, that John, if he was making this up, would not have cited Mary as the eyewitness because of the way culture was. 
That would not have been the person he would have cited if he was making this up. If he's writing to, to uh, uh, write the story. But in conjunction with who Christ was and how Christ operated in, in Christ's value of each and every human, Christ's selection of Mary as the announcer that he is resurrected and he's going to the Father and I've seen the Lord verification of his truth. And John focuses on Jesus' interaction with Mary, his tender interaction with her, compassionate interaction with her. Not only did Jesus reveal himself to Mary, but also Jesus reveals himself then to the disciples and to Thomas in 1922 and 24 to 27. Similarly, we look at the incarnation of Christ and the announcement of his birth in Luke 2, 8 to 18. What group did Jesus select, did God select to announce the birth of Christ? Was it, was it the elders of Israel? Was it the, the religious leaders? No, it, right, it's the shepherds. History tells us a marginalized people group out caring for people away from society. The lower levels of what People would have thought. And, and these are those who then observe, right, right after his birth, and then they go declare everything they saw, right, in the same way that, that Mary does. We could look at the Magi from Matthew 2, people from outside of Israel, right, are those who come and, and see the birth of Christ as a young child a couple years later, but are used by God to declare and verify. This is the Son of God. So both events are revealed to unlikely witnesses. Both events reveal the patience of God to build the faith of his people. As we, as we think about Christ and, and his interaction with Mary, back to, to John 20, it, it, it is striking how much time John takes um, in comparison to other parts of the narrative to, to discuss this conversation that happened. Um, great pains are taken to, to talk about it. It's, it's tender, it's compassionate, it's revealing. Um, she's fearful, she's weeping. And, and Jesus doesn't just dismiss her weeping. And why, why, didn't, why didn't you get it? Why didn't you believe? I've been, you know, I've been telling you this all this time. He's, he's not uh, curt and angry, but this compassionate concern for the doubt. And it's not just for Mary, but look, look at the process that John and Peter go through. Um, John and Peter race for the tomb. Uh, John arrives first, doesn't go in. Simon goes in, and it's interesting the, the attention made to the, to the flaws, the burial flaws in verse 7. He sees that the face cloth is lying, they fold it up in a place by itself. And in John 19, there's been uh, attention taken to verse 40. We see this, that uh, he was bound in the linen cloth. So we've got the burial, right? Uh, John's taking time to describe us, the, 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 the burial cloths that were used. <clears throat> so why would they have concluded this must be a resurrected Christ? Well, if he was just taken away, they would still be on his body, right? If he was just taken away and moved to another place, the burial cloths would, would, would still be on Jesus. Right? There wouldn't be any in the tomb. So if, John and Peter looked inside and seen an empty tomb, but no burial cloths. Well, they might have concluded the same thing that, that Mary did, that they've taken the Lord away somewhere. But by the fact that the burial cloths were there and they were nicely wrapped up, well, wow, that's, that's something. They, it, as John draws, draws our attention to this, they saw and believed. Because that's the point of the book over and over is that you would see and believe, that you would see, that you'd hear, you'd believe. So John, Peter, they saw and believed. How about the other disciples? Look at 19, 
to 22. Uh, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked for the Sabbath for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Why do you think he draws attention to the doors being locked? Some suggest that Jesus just passed through the door. Um, but we also have the fact they touched Jesus, right? There was, that, there was a physical contact with him. So it, it appears maybe this is more like the book of Acts, when Peter was locked in jail, and the angel of the Lord opened the doors, right? And Peter walked out. The locked doors didn't stop Jesus from walking in. He had a physical body. This is a physical resurrection. And as Jesus appears there, we don't see again a condemnation or why haven't you believed. In fact, the disciples are frightened. They're locked away. But Jesus is the visible appearance of God. What's the first thing he says to them? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Calming words, encouraging words, words reminding them of all the things he had done, and then a physical demonstration of his resurrection. He shows his hands and his side. Again, to see and believe. They saw the empty tomb, they saw the funeral clothes there, they believe. Now they see the Lord, they see his hands and his side. They were glad. Peace be with you. And then it's interesting, right here is kind of the great commission for John. He commissions them. What's he commissioned to do? As the Father sent me, so send I you. He, he, saw, he sees Mary. He said, Mary goes and tells everyone. He, the shepherds see the birth. They go tell everyone. The disciples see the resurrected Christ. What are they to do? Go. As the Father sent me, so send I you. He commissions them to minister on his behalf. Verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book. What was the purpose of those signs? Why did Jesus do those things? He did it to, to build their faith, that they would believe that Jesus is the Christ. Well, how about the struggling disciples? Maybe this could be you and I. At times, struggling with God's word, maybe struggling with the circumstances of life. Struggling to believe. What does Jesus do for them? Well, Thomas, the guy who missed, who's not with him when Jesus came. I wonder if, if Thomas later is like, you guys keep telling me about that. I missed that one. That was the, that was the dinner party I should have been at. <laughs> Jesus appeared. And, and, but Thomas didn't believe. He said, unless I see it too, I'm not going to take your word for it. What does Jesus do? Well, Thomas, you 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 made the, a list of demands, so I'm not going to meet them. I'm gonna you're you're gonna have to you're gonna I'm sorry you're, you're gonna miss out. No, what does he do? Eight days later, again doors are locked. Again Jesus comes and stands among them. Again he says, "Peace be with you," and he invites Thomas. Put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. See and touch and believe. John Thomas believes and he says, My Lord and my God. It's interesting both in both passages. When Thomas sees the Lord, he believes, he confesses, My Lord, my God. When the disciples see the Lord in verse 20, what do they say? The text says they were glad. When they saw the Lord. And Mary, when she sees the Lord, what does she do? She goes and announces the resurrection of the Lord. There's this joy when God's people believe the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said, He who was born at Bethlehem is God, and God with us. God, there lies the mystery. God with us, there lies the mercy. God, there in his glory, God with us, therein is grace. God alone might well strike us with terror, but God with us inspires us with hope and confidence. 
The disciples were, it wasn't just God's out there somewhere or God has left us, but God is with us. And you think of this announcement of Emmanuel, God with us. Just as there were for the disciples in the resurrection, there were signs affirming the birth of Christ, right? The announcement of the birth of Jesus was made by angels. Why, why did God choose to do it that way? Why did he announce it with angels? We wanted them to believe this was a sign of the glory of God, the angelic host, the glorious light. He's the star that led the Magi. What was that about? That was a sign so they would believe. So maybe you're asking, well, what has God done for me today that I might believe? Am I going to see a star, a glorious star? Am I going to see some, some light that might, uh, uh, some magic, you know, a, a magic trick of some sort or a miracle of some kind, and then I will believe. But what has God done for us? Look at verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by, that by believing you may have life in his name. So God has provided us with truth and evidence to affect our confidence and strengthen our faith. We've read the eyewitness testimony of the Magi and the Shepherd. We've read the eyewitness testimony not only of the 12 disciples, but of all the disciples, of Mary, others. And all that was written in John, the signs were done and performed so that you and I would believe. Now you might say, well, that's not as inspiring as seeing a miracle. That's not as inspiring as seeing a dead person brought to life. Well, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us this. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The author of Hebrews believes that what has come to us through Jesus Christ ought to be as impactful to you and to I as a prophetic word of an ancient prophet. That Christ has spoken through the word, and God's word is sufficient and powerful and enough to bring us to life in Christ. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and, and transforms us. It, but it's not, it's not that there's not evidence. It's not that, there, that these things were not attested to. That's why John is filled with statements of eyewitnesses, of people who saw it. When they saw the Lord, their lives were changed and transformed. We too are unlikely recipients of this grace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as is written, let no one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So as we put a capstone on, on this chapter 20 and the resurrected Christ and why we should believe the resurrection, why the resurrection helps you live with hope in your future, don't let the fact that we weren't there to see it minimize your confidence in it happening. John is filled with the, the evidence of its occurrence. However, intellectual evidence is not sufficient to bring people to faith. What is it that does that? It's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the reason why, if you believe in Christ, that he's the sinless Son of God, that he died in your place on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that he's coming again. The reason you believe that is not primarily because you did a critical thinking analysis of, of how likely is this to have occurred, 
And therefore, I've concluded what it's more, the preponderance of evidence is it's more likely than not, according to my jury. No, it, it's the Spirit of God took that truth and opened your eyes to, to believe it. Yeah. But belief and faith is not in a fable, it's not in a uh, speculation, it's not in something that's not sourced in history. And so as John is crafting and finishing this book for us, he drives us to say, look at the witnesses. The witnesses themselves were skeptical. The witnesses were convinced, and the witnesses were changed. After they saw the Lord, what happened? They were filled with joy. After they saw the Lord, they went and told others. After they saw the Lord, they believed, my Lord and my God. So it's tonight as we uh, continue through our lives, and maybe if you're like me at times, maybe struggle believing God. Uh, maybe not, you're not struggling to believe God exists or something like that, but that God indeed is working and active and is helping me in every each and every situation that he's sovereign over this world and over this life that I'm in. That indeed he's returning and coming again. And he has a purpose in place that, that he's called me to serve him in. That the Lord would take his word, our belief and our confidence in his word, that it's true. And that God kept his promises to Abraham, we studied Genesis. He kept his promises to the disciples. He kept his promises and he rose again that you and I too can believe the Lord because he's kept his promises. And by faith and looking at what God has done in our past, that we could look to the future, live in obedience. Whatever, whatever you're facing, whatever challenge is ahead of you, whatever thing that you're facing inside that, you know what, I can believe the Lord because he kept his promises, he's resurrected, I can believe what he has said, and he's working in my life, he's not abandoned me, I'm a recipient of his grace, I'm an unlikely recipient of his grace, but he's he's got future work for me to do, he's got future plans, he's got future plans for this body, he's got future plans for my life, that I might glorify him in. And so by faith, I'm going to obey him and do what he says, because of what we've seen in the Lord's past. Let's bow in prayer. Oh, Father, we, we delight and we rejoice in seeing the Lord. And while we haven't seen him physically, we see him in the Word. And we rejoice. We rejoice in knowing that he's alive, that he's real, that Jesus Christ has resurrected, that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father, that Jesus Christ is returning just as God promised the Messiah, and the Messiah came, and just as God promised a resurrection, and Jesus resurrected from the grave. And how God is so patient with us to, to show us and teach us so that we might have faith to live for you that we might have faith to accomplish the work you've called us to do, that we might have faith to walk with you in the path you've given us. Oh God, we ask that you might strengthen our confidence and our hope in you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the details of it. We thank you for the names you mentioned and their responses and your compassion with them that we too might have hope, that we too might strive to know Christ, that we too might believe that the Lord is not done with us, that we too might live in obedience to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing a song, ancient words talking about the truth and veracity of God's word.
Jesus Christ. Amen. Where is this? 